be here. It's great to see you all here. It's summer and we're pretty, we're still pretty, not that is packed, but we have uh, a fair number of people here. I'm very pleasantly surprised to see you all. I hope you continue that um, for the rest of the summer. Um, we're going to be in one place today. I'll, I'll be referring to other passages, but you only need your Bible open to one place. That is Colossians chapter 4, uh, verses 8 through, excuse me, 7 through 18. And we're going to finish Colossians today. It's going to be done. It's going to be over, completed. So, uh, cause for celebration. Um, for some of you, I know. Um, and for me, too, actually. I'm kind of glad to be finished here. Uh, but it's been a great journey. Let's go ahead and pray first and ask for God's blessing as we go through this text. Father, we thank you uh, for your letter to the Colossians and for preserving that letter for us. Uh, we thank you for um, this word that you've given us. Lord, I pray that I, my preaching today will be faithful to it. That what I say will be in accordance with and consistent with your word. I pray that we together as a congregation will be changed, transformed, convicted, moved um, by your spirit, um, working through your word um, as, we, as we listen to what you have to say today. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Um, okay, well, uh, verses 7 through 18, I will uh, confess to you I was very tempted to skip over them. I was, I've been skipping, I, I'm always tempted to skip over these sections of Paul's letters where Paul uh, says goodbye to people, he commends people who've been working with him, he references situations that are kind of lost to us in some ways. This seems to my mind anyway when I run into it in my sinfulness to inhabit the same literary genre as an Academy Award speech. The thank yous and the goodbyes and the commendations. And so, again, I'm tempted to skip um, over it, but, um, but I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to. Um, the question, or the reason I'm tempted to skip over it is because I sometimes come to the Bible with this question in mind. And that question is, how is all of this in any way relevant to me? That's not a bad question. It's not a bad question because, yes, the Bible is God's way of speaking directly to you and, and to your life. But we also need to remember what Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, that all Scripture is God-breathed. It's God-breathed. And it's useful. So what that means is it's not only a, a, a guidebook for life and a map to help us get through, the, through our lives and apply to our various situations. It's also... It's also knowledge about God, about who He is, about His character, about His attributes. Every word, we're told, is God-breathed. Every word. So when we approach a, a passage like this, that's where our minds and our hearts should be. Lord, teach us something about You. Let the truths that You've revealed here inform uh, our love for You and our knowledge of you. We don't want to approach any section of the Bible like we might approach a potluck dinner, right? We kind of avoid the, um, the jello with bits of food in it and we go for uh, something else you like more or whatever. We don't want to approach by the Bible in that way. We need all of it to be mature and to grow. Now, what are my, what are my goals in preaching through a book, in Colossians especially, is to show you to demonstrate that God's Word is powerful. That you can come and you can, you can face a passage like this, and there have been other passages that seemed on the surface to get to offer nothing to us. And God uses teaching through this Word and preaching through this Word, as long as it's consistent with this Word, to grow you, to nurture you. No one's left the church since I started preaching Colossians. Amazing. In fact, we had groans that started preaching Colossians. Something that people say, oh no, people are on our way. But they, they haven't, they come because the word of God is powerful and it's effective. Alright, well, there is a lot here today, and we're not going to have time to go verse by verse. Um, instead, we're going to stand back and take this passage in as a whole, kind of like you might do when you go to an art museum and you see one of those dot paintings, you know, if you get really close to a dot painting, it just has a bunch of dot and you can't see much. But if you step back and, and take the whole thing in at once, it, it kind of you can see a beautiful portrait uh, and picture begin to emerge. And we are going to see that today in this text. But 
let's remember before we start, because these are these points are going to be there, let's remember the main themes of Colossians as we discover them, as we walk through them. I'm going to write them down if you don't have them, so that next time we're preaching through Colossians, which should be 30 years from now when I finish preaching through the Old Testament, um, when we get back here, you'll have those notes right ready for you to go through when we, when we come back, um, or when you're reading Colossians on your own. The first theme is this, is that Jesus is the divine king of the cosmos. His lordship might be difficult for us to see when we consider the state of the world. How many things are messed up? Might be difficult to see his lordship over all things. Um, but that's because his kingdom grows slowly, organically, like a vine that undermines ultimately a very strong wall. It, close, it, it climbs and seeps into the cracks and tears them apart. That's the kingdom of God. Um, Jesus grows, or his, his gospel is growing, uh, Paul said in his first chapter, um, across the world. Wherever it's preached, seeds are planted and it grows, soul by soul, city by city, continent by continent. The gospel is turning the upside down world right side up. Second thing, this upending. This overturning that God is doing at a, at a macro level on the world, um, He is also doing in you and in me. You are being transformed so that the direction of your passions and desires is increasingly Godward rather than selfward. The Colossians uh, saw religion as a way to get something else. So they would go to a temple, if I were a Colossian um, pagan, I would bring my offerings and my sacrifices to a temple, and um, I would want the god of the goddess to give me something else. I would, I would go to uh, a temple of a goddess and say, can I have a good marriage, can I have a baby, my wife had a baby, can I have um, food, can I have good crops, whatever, and I would bring my offerings and sacrifices to get that thing, that other good thing. Paul kicks that mentality head on. And he says, Christianity is nothing like that. We don't come to Jesus Christ to get some other good thing. We don't come to Jesus Christ just to have our marriages go well and our job go well and um, uh, to have food in the pantry. He does give us that, but that's not why we come to Jesus Christ. We come to Jesus Christ for Jesus Christ. He is the treasure. He said to himself, those who lose their life for my sake gain it. We come to him, and when we do, we lose our life for him. He's the pearl of great price. We heard that parable last week. So, um, you were made for him, not the other way around. That's the second thing. Third, um, to be in Christ is necessarily to be a member of his body, of his church. You cannot, you cannot have one without the other. If you are in Christ, you are also in the church. And here, right here, not in the building, but in this community, in among this people, a good shepherd and in other churches across the city and across the world, um, the church is the place where Christ reveals the end. The church is the place where God's will is done on earth. It's supposed to be anyway. Where God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. So the church itself, when people walk in here, when people get to know you, when people see you, they should be seeing a portrait of what Christ is going to do in the future when he returns and establishes his people. Good Shepherd is supposed to be an outpost of heaven where the community that Jesus will raise up when he returns is made visible. So the way we live together at coffee hour in the kitchen, in our mission groups, in our families. Um, everything that we do, in all that we do, the veil that shields the present from the future is to be ripped open so that everyone who sees us can also get a taste of heaven. Is your life like that? Is your life like that? Is this community's life like that? Does this church smell, look, taste, feel like the kingdom of God? And does that quality, does that taste go deep so that it tastes like what it really is? 
Or we like a movie trailer. If you ever watched a movie trailer that looks like a really good movie, you never go see that. And you go sit in the film, and when it's over, you realize that all the good parts are in the trailer, and there's nothing really there in the film. I think that. So in Paul, seemingly random, and this is where this kind of falls into our sermon for today, or our lesson for today. In Paul's seemingly random instructions and commendations in verses 7 through 18, you can taste and see the kingdom of God. And what's curious about it is I don't think Paul is even trying. Paul is living out the gospel in his where he is. And what he writes just in his goodbye reveals a portrait of the church in the world. And we'll see that as we walk through. Paul's the real thing. So um, even his mundane is a window into heaven. You see that? All right, let's start off. And we're going to take these by three sections. The first section we're going to look at is verses 7 through 9. Go ahead and um, look down at that section. You notice that two men are named. One is Tychicus. And the other is Onesimus. And I'm sure I'm pronouncing those names as they would not have been pronounced in the first century, but that's just what I'm going to do. Um, Tychicus and Onesimus carry this letter, they're carrying this letter to Colossae, and some other letters which we'll talk about um, in a minute. They are charged with reading it to the congregation. So they're going to go to the Colossian congregation, they're going to stand up and they're going to read this letter like I'm doing right now, like. Um, just as if they were preaching a sermon. And then they're going to explain it, right? Because they've been with Paul, they know what Paul meant when he wrote the words that he wrote. And so when they, when they read the letter, it's not going to be absent of teaching, it's going to be with teaching. They're going to be preaching and teaching along with this letter. They are, in short, they are heralds of the apostle. And it's a great, great honor. Now notice here, Paul calls Tychicus his brother in faithful ministry. You see that? He also calls him his fellow servant. That's a very nice sanitized way of uh, translating the word syndulos, which is uh, fellow, not servant, but slave. Fellow slave. Now, in the world, in, in reality, of course, in the, it's not, not reality, but maybe uh, social reality at this time, Tychicus was a free man. And so is Paul. But they call one another, and Paul says, he is my fellow slave. I'm a slave, and he's a slave with me. Now, notice there's one other man. Um, who is a messiness? He's a slave. Hey, thank you. Thank you, thank God. He is a slave. Now, of the three, Tychicus and um, Onesimus and Paul, Onesimus is the only slave, and he is the only one Paul does not refer to as a slave. We might miss that. The Colossians, however, knowing Onesimus as the escaped slave that he is, would not have missed that. They would have gotten him. And someone else would have gotten him too. Philemon. Who knows who Philemon was? Onesimus' master. Guess where he went to church? Philosophy. He went to the church that, that, that Onesimus and Tychicus were going to be preaching to. Philemon would have seen this shift in language that Paul gives. Onesimus is Philemon's slave, and Philemon is in the, the, the Colossian. Congregation. So here's a message. He's going to preach and teach as an apostolic herald to Philemon. Remember, if you will, what Paul, we looked at this a couple weeks ago. Remember, if you will, what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 7. He who is called in the Lord a slave is a freedman in the Lord. Likewise, he who is free when called is a slave of Christ. You know that? In Colossians 3, verse 11, Paul writes, Here in the church there is no slave, no free. There is no slavery to man 
in the kingdom of God. And Paul makes that very clear. We're just in this, in this accommodation of both men where he leaves out the word slave when he describes the, the, the real slave. And knowing as he does that Onesimus himself is carrying a letter to Philemon from Paul, essentially commanding his release. There is no slavery in the kingdom of God. The kingdom overturns the world. Class divisions, and that's what this was in the first century, the, the division between slave and free, it was, it was definitely a, a bondage situation, it was also a class division. Class divisions die in the church. Laborers teach professionals. Employees Pastor bosses. Poor people hold offices of honor, and rich people can possibly be cleaning toilets. God knows no partiality. Paul isn't here making an effort to treat Onesimus as a free man, it's just simply reality. It's truth. That should be Good Shepherd. So we don't want to say, for example, when we're talking to people about Good Shepherd, we don't want to say, we care for the lower classes and the downtrodden and the poor. We care for those people. Because the category lower class no longer exists in the church. We serve our brothers and sisters who may or may not have as much money as we do, right? It's very patronistic or patronizing to say we're a church that cares for the poor, cares for the non -trading. Who cares for our brothers and sisters who don't have enough class divisions die in the church? Second, look at verses, let's move to the second section here. Look at verses 10 through 14. There are six people mentioned here. There's Aristarchus, Mark, Justus, Epaphras, Luke, and Demas. Now you may have, uh, you may recognize Luke. He is the one who wrote uh, the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. And Mark is the one who wrote the Gospel that goes by his name. These six men form Paul's ministry team. These are the ones who are assisting him while he's in prison. That's where he's writing this. He's in prison in Rome. These guys are kind of the guys that he's raised up to help him. Now let me give you some background here so you can understand why this is important to know. Many Jewish Christians believed that Gentiles had to be circumcised and follow the Old Testament law, uh, purity law, in order to be saved. Many of the Jewish Christians of the day lived as if their acts of obedience, of their doing right and not doing wrong according to the law, was the way that they were made righteous before God. That was a big fight in the early church. And Paul um, very strongly said, Oh no, that better not be the way we were made righteous before God. That better not be it. Because if so, we are doomed. It's not our work, but Christ's work. We trust in Him. I know there are many people um, here who, uh, not many, maybe, but some who tend to see their work in the church or their good deeds in the world as things that throw notches on their belt that prove their righteousness before God. Oh no, that's not the gospel. Well, anyway, underneath this theological fight to get the Gentiles to follow the law, the purity law, and to be circumcised, also lay a bed of cultural ethnic tension. Jews thought Gentiles were dirty, nasty people. They ate pork, they ate shellfish, um, they hung out um, in um, idols' temples, they ate food that had been sacrificed to idols. Um, they had a healthy eating, uh, uh, nasty eating habits and unhealthy um, lifestyles. And so um, they were disgusted by the Gentiles. Um, and so underneath this desire, to, 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 underneath this theological fight was also this ethnic um, tension where a Jew who'd been going to, to, to church and had become a Christian and still continue to practice Judaism sees this Gentile guy who he knows eats pork 
And maybe he saw it two weeks ago before his conversion, hanging out with a temple prostitute somewhere in some temple. Now, all of a sudden, this dirty, nasty Gentile, because he came to faith in Jesus, is to be considered a child of Abraham. Like us. That was a scandal to many Jewish people. And it's not so strange, I suppose. In Japan, I remember I visited when I was 16, I was told um, that white people, uh, like myself, make many Japanese people feel sick because we smell like cheese. I didn't know this. But uh, my, I guess my skin, they told me my skin feels it smells like cheese. White people in general do. And, and we were, uh, I was told that I would be considered a barbarian. And so um, it was very generous and hospitable for Japanese people to let me into their home just because of my of my smell and the nastiness which they which they brought a clean to me. Um, and that I had I was able to get into that and understand Japanese there because I was raised in Texas where Hispanic people are considered dirty, nasty people because of the things they eat, the way they live. Um, it's it's not just that they have different cultures and lifestyle. Those different cultures and lifestyle, we attach values to them. And um, many in Texas consider Hispanics to be not just different, but lesser and in, in a disgusting, unclean, and dirty way. We humans tend to take color and culture and ethnic and regional differences and make them value differences. There was a very wealthy white church in Michigan, Anglican church, I'm sorry to say, in Michigan that started to do what we're doing, is to have a chicken bowl or, I'm sorry, a soup kitchen. And they were in, a, over, it had become a black, poor neighborhood over time. It wasn't originally going to become like that. So um, the people who kind of came to the shepherds, excuse me, to the soup kitchen, um, were mainly minority and poor. Um, over time, some of those people who came to this situation started to believe in Jesus and come to that church. About 70 actually started coming to that church. Guess what happened? No, they didn't turn away. The pastor wouldn't let that happen. But something else happened. The white people went away. That's right. Look what's happening to our church. Look at all these people in here. These dirty, nasty, poor people who don't look like us. That's um, that's a common, common human way of being, and that is kind of the way Jews recognize or look at Gentiles in the first century. Now, look at the men Paul chooses for his ministry team. We have three Jews: Aristarchus, Mark, and Justice. Paul calls the men of the circumcision there in verse eleven, and they give him comfort. He says. And three Gentiles, Epaphras, Luke, and Demas. Paul notices the difference between Jew and Gentile. But for him, the differences enhance the beauty and the glory and the power of the kingdom of God. They don't divide it. In Revelation, chapter 21, chapter 22, we get this vision of all the nations, tribes, tongues, and peoples gathered before the throne of God. And it's not like their tongues and their tribes cease to be. It's just that there are no longer dividing factors and divisive factors in the community that Christ is going to establish. Those enhance the beauty of the coming people. The glory, the power of God in uniting all people. And so here Paul, in just choosing these three Jews and three Gentiles as part of his ministry team, reveals to us another aspect of God's kingdom. Not only is there no slavery, no bondage, no partiality in God's kingdom, but it's also a place where people are reconciled. Peoples are reconciled. I understand that sometimes ethnic differences shape the way that we worship Jesus and that's fine and good and some kind of sometimes. And so often you'll have uh, an African American uh, Christian congregation uh, primarily meeting together and worshiping and you'll have a white uh, congregation and you'll have an Anglo Anglo Asian congregation and they all worship in different ways so they all kind of you know, gather in the different churches. And I guess some of that's okay but I think it's extremely pleasing to God when believers 
purposely break that pattern. Commit to break that pattern. And form congregations that look like God's kingdom will look in the end. All nations, peoples, tribes, tongues, nations. Alright, let's look at some of the individuals that Paul names. Because they are also revealing. We only had time to look at three of them. Let's look at Mark first. Um, he would later team up with Peter and pen the gospel of Mark. That's one reason it has apostolic authority, because Peter's authority lies behind it. Now, Mark was not always Paul's esteemed co-worker that he is here. Uh, Mark is, as Paul notes in verse 10, Barnabas' cousin, and together Paul, Barnabas, and Mark went off on the first missionary journey into Turkey, and while they were there, things got a little dicey, things got a little hairy, and um, too much for Mark, and at a very crucial moment in his first missionary journey, Mark said, no way, I'm out of here, and he took off and went back to Jerusalem. Well, Paul reasoned, understandably, you can't have a coward on a mission team, especially when you're going into these, these places where we might get beaten and stoned and possibly killed. So Paul said to Barnabas, you know what, uh, we're going to go on another journey, but this time, you know, leave Cousin Mark at home. And Barnabas said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take him with me. We're going to go somewhere else. And you go on your way. They had this big fight. They crossed. They parted ways. Um, and Mark did not go on with Paul. Um, and uh, that's what happened. That was about 14 and 15 years before this letter was written. No one knows what happened in the intervening years, but something changed. Now Mark stands with Paul, the prisoner, and proclaims the gospel in the heart of the empire. What a dangerous thing to do. What a great thing to do. Mark is a changed man. Paul has seen that change and he embraces it. The kingdom of God is a place of change. Jesus makes cowards brave. He gives liars integrity. He gives compassion to the cruel. He gives self-control to those who are bound by addiction. And he raises up the fallen. That's why you're here. That's why I'm here. When you see, therefore, a flaw in your character, and I hope you see some flaws in your character, because if not, you're not looking very hard. When you see a flaw in your character, don't ever excuse it by saying, and I hear this all the time, I sometimes say it, that's just who I am. That's just who I am, you've got to accept it. If it's truly a flaw in your character, it's a simple flaw, no, it's not who you are. It is not. That's what sin has done to you, possibly, but that's not who you are. And Christ is going to change that, whatever it is. Now or later, or he's going to start now and finish later, I don't know, but he's going to change it. There are no slaves in the church, either materially or spiritually. Jesus will break every bond that binds you. And so our task is to continue to offer those things up to him. That's one half of the equation. Here's what that means for our relationships. In the world, and I do this all the time, you probably do too, in the world when someone crosses me, someone lies to me, someone cheats me, someone does something that reveals a kind of underhanded character, that's it. That's their God. From now on, I will never re regard that person in the same way. That person can say I'm sorry. That person can apologize. But I've already seen through that person. I know that person's character. I make a judgment, and that judgment stands for a long, long time. Now, if Paul had done that, we may not have the gospel of Mark. 
The church is populated by men and women who God is making holy. Someone unfit for a task today may be just the man or the woman tomorrow. So we look for change in people. We embrace change when it comes to, I know there are some people, I've spoken to them, who formed an opinion about another brother and sister here at this church five years ago. That was true five years ago. And they are unable to see any change in that person that everyone else can see. And you need to repent of that. I need to repent of that. If we believe the gospel, we believe that Christ changes sinners and affirm that change. He changed Mark. Paul recognized it. The church is a place of change and it's also a place of restoration. Secondly, let's look at Apophis. Apophis is from Colossae. In fact, he's the one who brought the gospel there. He heard Paul preach. He believed. He was saved. He took the gospel to Colossae, Hierapolis, and Laodicea. He is their primary teacher and um, probably if he had been there, he'd be a bishop or what we would consider their bishop. But he is right now with Paul in Rome. And Paul writes, notice this, that he's struggling, this is verse 12 and 13, he's struggling on your behalf in his prayers that he may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and Hierapolis. Notice the work. Notice the labor of Apophis. We often associate work in the church with cleaning, Fixing, cooking, reading, teaching, preaching, visiting the sick. I don't know that we really much put the work of the church with the prayer in the category of work, which is what Paul has done here. Apophis is struggling in prayer for the Colossians, for others. He's working, laboring for them. But think about it. The Holy Spirit, who indwells me, also indwells you. So like if I, if I want you guys to be like, it's not the value here, okay. Take that out of my image here. So if I want you guys to be interested in mission, and I want you to be interested in evangelism, I remember a Sunday ago I asked, two Sundays ago, I asked everyone to raise their hand who loves to share the gospel with their friends and neighbors, and you were all very honest and no one raised their hand. So if I want that to be, if I want that to change, if I want that to, to change, if I want you, every one of you, to be interested in scripture, eager to read your Bibles and to pray, um, I can stand up here and yell at you every Sunday, which is great. God works through that. He does. I mean, I think so. He does. I can yell at you every Sunday. Um, or, or and, I'll say and, I can pray. But when I pray, I'm being sneaky. I'm being under him. Right now, I'm talking to you. You might have all kinds of walls against what I'm saying. You say, I don't want to buy them. That is like nonsense. But when I pray, I go right underneath those walls, right to your heart, because the Holy Spirit lives there. And I can say, hey, take that stubborn uh, Lee. I'll use Lee as an example. Take that stubborn Lee and um, bend him to your will, right? Great trick. It's worked in this church since I've been here for eight years. You may not know that, but I pray for you guys every week. And when I know. I see something that I'm praying that will mature in the church as a whole or as you as an individual, I will lift that up. And I've seen God do some amazing things. And you can do that for me, not that I have anything to change. But you can do that for me too. And ask that God does that changes me as well. He does that stuff. It's a great trick in your marriage too. Instead of nagging your husband or nagging your wife, you can pray and God will come up and change it. Where a good shepherd doesn't reflect the kingdom of God, there is a call to work, to pray that God changes hearts and minds and brings maturity. Because, as we said over and over and over again, God uses the prayer of His people to change His people and change the world. The church is a place built on prayer. Third, look at Demas. We don't know much about Demas. Demas right now in this, in this letter is part of Paul's ministry team. He's one of the top echelon guys. Um, but look at, um, well, you don't have to turn here, but um, a few, five or six years later, Paul writes to Timothy, his second letter, 
to Timothy. And in chapter 4, verse 10, we read this about Demas. Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me. When Jesus comes back, the church will be a place of pure holiness. Now it's a place where messed up people come to Jesus to be healed. That means that people here will fail you. If your faith, if your participation in this body rests on how other people behave or live out their Christian life, you put your trust in the wrong place. I am going to fail you. I probably already have for some of you, but if you just come to this church and you think I'm really a great pastor, I'm going to fail you. I'm going to keep failing you. And it's going to fail you. Your teachers and leaders and mission groups and Bible studies are going to fail you. Your friends and neighbors and brothers and sisters will fail you, but Jesus never will. And what's more, he'll never abandon his bride, unfaithful though she is. So you, when you're failed by other people, stay in him and stay with his bride. And guess what? There's another part of this, and that's that you also are going to fail you. We're very used to other people failing us, but it really helps to recognize that we fail ourselves every day. We do. And God stays with you. Jesus stays with you. And He wants us to stay with each other. Alright, finally, the last section, verses 15 through 18. There's a lot of things there. We're only going to look at one. Um, notice that uh, Paul uh, does say to uh, uh, Nympha, who has a church in her house, he, he sends his greeting to her. Um, he gives a command to some guy named um, Archippus about fulfilling the ministry that the Lord has given him. We don't know what that is. We don't know. Um, but I do want to pay attention to what Paul commands in this section. Paul commands that this letter be read to the church. And in exchange with the letter to Laodicea, which may be Ephesians. We don't know what that letter is. Or maybe Laodicea letter that is, is just lost. We don't know. Why does Paul make this a command? Well, Paul knows this letter is more than just a letter. Because of his apostleship, Paul knows that God is breathing through his teachings. God uses his word through Paul is going to use his word through Paul and through the other apostles to overturn strongholds, to soften hearts, to convict of sin, to comfort, to nourish, to strengthen, and to make whole. You may not believe that, we may not believe that, but it's true. We've seen it over the course of the life of this church. We know Jesus, and he works in us and through his, through us, through his word. And so Paul commands that it be read and studied and explained because he says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, the church is built on the foundation of his apostles and prophets. Now, I know some of you, this is the only Bible you get all week long. You come to church and this is it. If that is you, you have a very weak foundation you need to follow this command from Paul and read his letters. He just spends a time on the foundation of the church, which is the apostles of the New Testament and the prophets, the old. That's how the church grows and, and becomes more and more like Jesus, is with individuals and us together corporately. Study, respect, and fear, um, sit under with eagerness to listen and receive what God has to say. And it's very, very um, discouraging sometimes to see um, uh, 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 Asha here, um, an attitude toward the Bible which is something like um, just read it and get over it. Just read it and let's get past it. 
Just preach for 10 minutes and let's go on. No. This is the Word of God. Without it, this place will die. With it, as we have seen, the gospel has grown and strengthened us. It is growing like a vine in us and it's building in the city. It's the foundation of the church. And Paul ends his letter by calling attention to it and commanding that it be read. Alright, so what we've seen in just this, these last verses, the kingdom, uh, the kingdom of God revealed that without Paul even trying, um, he's shown a divided world reconciled by the gospel. He's shown the, sin, the chains of sin and slavery broken. He's shown ethnic barriers destroyed. He's shown individual lives changed. A community that is transformed through prayer and a place where Christ alone is trustworthy and sufficient. And he showed that his word is foundational for all amazing, wonderful things we see in these last few verses. And they are, in fact, um, all picking up on themes that Paul has already spoken of throughout Colossians. Okay, we'll stop here. That's it. Um, we have finished Colossians. Um, next week I will be here, uh, Mark uh, Carlton will be here preaching. Um, and when I come back, we'll be doing the lectionary for a while, and then in October we'll pick up the book of John. Let's go ahead and pray and ask God to bless us. Father, we thank you for um, this time we've had in your word. I pray that you use it and continue to use it. Continue to use it. To convict, to nourish, to teach, to raise us up and train us. Um, Lord, I pray, um, I thank you for your, your, um, your word to us through Paul's letter to the Colossians. I thank you for this whole study. I pray that um, those things that we've learned and we've forgotten be stored away in our hearts and in our minds and that you, through your Holy Spirit, pull them up and apply them to us uh, when we need it. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name.